And we are live. Good morning, everyone. Um, we are back with another broadcast. It's Monday, and I'm looking forward. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time. We have Robert Pondicio, and we're going to be speaking about his book, How the Other Half Learns. Um, I think that this is like the topic that is going to clean my palate after having had so many conversations about like COVID and the national uh, health emergency that we're having. This is different and this is good for us. So, um, Robert, thank you for coming on this morning. Appreciate it. So let me start with Tiffany. Tiffany is a person mm -hmm. in your book, and I think it's a good starting point for the discussion about the book because, uh, you know, uh, throughout the book, there are threads of why Tiffany is important to this story. And in the end, um, in the epilogue, Tiffany is there too, as someone who you say that any conversation about educational equity has to include people like Tiffany. So why don't we like start with who Tiffany was and why, yeah. why you made that statement? Yeah, because you want to make me cry first thing in uh, <laughs> 20 years on and I still get emotional when I when I think and write about uh, Tiffany. Um, okay, so who is Tiffany? I, I guess a brief bit of backstory would be helpful. Um, my, uh, my, my journey into education was, um, and I'm candid about it, I describe it as a mid-career impulse purchase. In other words, I was not that you know, that eight-year-old kid who played school with my friends in the backyard and 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 thought, boy, I'm going to be a teacher when I grow up. Mm -hmm. um, I, I ended up as a mid-career teacher. I had a whole other career in the media business until I was nearly 40 and then signed up for, uh, on, again, on a bit of a lark, um, for a program called the, the New York City Teaching Fellows in New York City uh, and ended up teaching uh, fifth grade at PS 277 in the South Bronx circa 2002 um and just by way of perspective ps277 was at the time and i think still is uh the lowest performing elementary school in new york city's lowest mm. performing school district district seven the south Bronx. Um, so the, the vast majority of students that i had as a fifth grade teacher were either below grade level or very below grade level and then there was this girl named tiffany uh, in my second year, um, she was, as we would have said back then, a double three, meaning she was on grade level, uh, a three in math, a three in ELA on her state test in a school where virtually nobody was was a double three. Um, and when I pointed out one day, you know, one of these kind of moments that matter that kind of set uh, a different course of my life and career, when, when I pointed out to my special ed supervisor, hey, I've got this kid, you know, Tiffany, uh, I'm not doing anything for her. I'm, you know, basically, um, you know, she 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 shows up every day in her uniform, her homework neatly done. You know, I used to joke that the building could fall down and Tiffany would be, you know, behind her desk scribbling away. <laughs> um, I mean, she was that she was just that that diligent, dutiful, bought in, dialed in kid. So, you know, I said to my special ed supervisor, "Look, I'm not doing anything for Tiffany." And and she said, and this was the thing that kind of you know resonated with me, verbatim quote, "She's not your problem." Hmm. And what she meant by that, um, earnestly, I imagine, was, you know, why are you worried about this this kid who's, you know, she's, she's doing what you need her to do. She is, or more to the point, she's where we need her to be. She's on grade level, you know. Um, be worried about her, get, the, get your one and two in the game. Um, but, you know, it, it, the, 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 in respect, and actually at the time, the injustice, to be blunt, kind of troubled me. Um, I mean, this it's, it's also, also worth noting that at the time, being on grade level um, was not exactly a prize. New York City, mm -hmm. New York famously, was one of those states uh, that had what, what my colleagues at the Fordham Institute called the proficiency illusion. Kids who were adding and subtracting on their fingers who were somehow miraculously being you know, adjudged on grade level on their state mm -hmm. tests mm -hmm. when it was clear they weren't, you know? And so, so uh, I, I don't, I don't want to cast aspersions on a young lady who I, you know, love, adore, and I'm in, co in contact with uh, to this day. But the idea that somehow on grade level was a significant achievement was just you know, kind of absurd. Um, you know, and, and then I contrasted that with, you know, my own daughter was, was going to school at the time. She wasn't that much older than Tiffany a couple of years. 
uh, to a very nice private school on the Upper East Side. Mm-hmm. Um, where if, if, if that young lady, Tiffany, had been in my daughter's school, I think I said this in the book, we'd all be working for her right now. I mean, mm-hmm. with this tenacity, this grit, this, this profound investment she had in her own education, um, this, this was the type of kid um, you know, that the sky is the limit for. And, and look, she's a young lady. Hopefully, you know, she will, she will still become everything that she, she was clear to me at age 10 that she could be. Um, Mm -hmm. but the idea that somehow we were going to say as educators, oh, you're just fine where you are, you know, Mm -hmm. you're a double three. Why are you worried about saying to her teacher, why are you worried about this kid? She's fine. Um, you know, nobody would say that to, to, to me as a parent about my daughter, you know, Mm -hmm. as a student. So the 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 um, you know the kind of the the the, the limit that we are putting on that child at that age uh, has always struck me as just the most profound kind of injustice. So is the idea that we are leaving behind in our discussions in ed, ed reform, we're speaking so much about those that are very far behind and and have uh, yeah. such significant issues um, that were that Tiffany students like Tiffany get lost in the mix. Yeah, I mean, to, you know, to, to over-intellectualize it, if, you, if you'll allow me for a little I mean, what do we mean when we say the achievement gap? I mean, typically, those of mm-hmm. us in Wonk world have test score gap. So therefore, by that by that metric, mm-hmm. sure, you know, that, that gap between, you know, a Tiffany and, and her more, you know, fortunate peers is closed, right? She's delivering results that are similar. Mm-hmm. My interpretation of the achievement gap um, is 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 a uh, uh, not just a fairness gap, but a leadership gap in a sense. In other words, mm-hmm. when I when I say that my, you know we should all be working for 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 Tiffany, I mean I, that's a, only a mild exaggeration. Uh, when you take a kid who has that kind of um, you know again not just ability and grit and tenacity, but that bought inness that I'm describing. This is a person who. You know, her. Uh, she's deeply invested in education. Through her actions, demonstrates that she sees this as a means to uh, an end in her life. Well, this is this is the type of kid that you want to see, that we should all want to see as Americans, uh, prosper, grow, and lead us. In a sense, she has mm-hmm. what she needs to be part of the leadership gap. Uh, or, or to close the leadership gap in this country. Now, will that happen? Um, well, frankly, not if we tell kids like that or their parents or their teachers, oh, you're on grade level, you're fine. That's not enough. Mm-hmm. So we're actually, we have low expectations even for the highest performing students that are in yeah. disadvantaged circumstances. I guess that's right. That's exactly right. All right. So this is where it gets controversial. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. um, so let's go there. The, the the controversy here, right? Um, you always this, require to lean into controversy, Chris. Well, I so I, I wonder if this gets us into a discussion about good kids versus the others. Yeah, I mean, I'm not comfortable saying good kids, bad kids. Although, frankly, a lot of teachers, you know, privately do engage in that or indulge that conversation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, we we could look at. Uh, I I hear things that people to the right of center say. Like the good kids deserve an education like everybody else. Or when we talk about discipline, you know, I hear things like, you know, it's it's wrong for the bad kids to disrupt the education of the good kids. And and maybe not in that simple of terms. People don't use good and bad. What's yeah, that? How about, how about this? It's 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 not necessarily your good kids or your bad kids. Again, that kind of that language just, you know, I'm not comfortable with it. But it's, you know, how do you treat your best customers in a, in a sense? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I, I've, I've often um, ruefully joked that the orientation we have as education reformers <clears throat> is to suggest if, if we were running a restaurant, we would have hungry people, you know, waiting to, to be served. And we would say, oh, I'm sorry, we, we, we can't feed you right now because there's still mm-hmm. people out on the sidewalks who are not inside yet. So mm-hmm. until we have everyone seated, then, then, then we will, um, uh, then, then, then we'll feed you. You know, so I wonder though, when, when we think of it in terms of Tiffany, like her story, which I think there are a lot of <laughs> Tiffany's out there, but sure. let's say we did well by all of them. Let's say we pulled together <clears throat> all of the Tiffany's and we did well by them. Mm-hmm. Okay, mission accomplished on that set of people. Then what, yeah, what we, about for everybody else? Like, you know, the kids that don't have the parents that Tiffany had. Yeah, or, yeah. Well, this, you know. this is where I've gotten myself, I guess, in a little bit of trouble with this book is, is you know, that standard pushback. Oh, Pondicio, you don't care about the ones and twos. You don't care about the non-Tiffany's. And mm-hmm, that's, mm-hmm. That, that is not the point. 
Um, my point is that we don't have the right as as educators to say what that special ed supervisor said to me, which is she's not your problem. Um, mm -hmm. Either we believe that we should do right by every child or we do not. So the idea that somehow, I mean, think of what that that statement meant um, or what, what she was trying to communicate to me as, as a teacher. Um, again, this kid is delivering the results we as educators need. Therefore, your work with her is done. She is not your problem. Focus on the other kids. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And again, the, 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 the very pointed point here is that nobody says that to the parent teacher uh, of an affluent white child. It just doesn't mm -hmm. happen, right? Mm -hmm. So why do we think it's okay um, for someone, you know, in, in, in an official capacity, because that's what we are as public educators, we are government employees to, to exercise that, that judgment and to say, no, this is a finished product at age 10. Don't worry about that. Mm -hmm. You've got problems. Do you worry that, um, the Tiffany story, which, you know, certainly resonates with me in that, um, I believe that when we talk about kids of color or low income kids, we talk about them as if they're all one yeah, and that absolutely. it's, that it's universally bad. There's no range. Yeah. And I think it's really important yeah. for everybody to, to acknowledge that every human population has range, right? Like, sure. you know, like, so when you talk, like, you mm -hmm. know, that there's something wrong with the discussion when you start talking about any group of people without acknowledging that there's a range of them and talking as if they're one. Like every nope. poor kid is is struggling. Not every poor kid is struggling, right? Correct. Um, not every uh, not every single mom has a kid that's out of out of hand, and not every middle class family has kids that are perfectly studious, right? Yeah. Like like, yeah. and and I think we get lost in the stereotypes too often. Yeah. But with Tiffany, aren't we in danger of creating something like a model minority um, when we when we look at Tiffany's situation? If we found everyone mm -hmm. like her the ones that really were on track or on track to do well and we weren't doing well by them. Yeah. You know, I'm just wondering like how many of, how much of the problem would you solve by handling just that right now? What's the problem? Well, I mean the problem, uh, well, uh, what, that's what a good question. Saying, that's a, that's a great question. How much of the problem are you solving? What, yeah. what do you specifically mean by the problem? That's a great question. So, so, when I think about everybody comes, I think to ed reform or to ed activism with a different, I think, kind of scope. But we act as if we all have the same one, right? So mine is pretty simple. Here's mine because I come from a working class background. So here's mine. Mine is: Do you graduate from high school capable of doing something that earns you a seat in the American mainstream economy? And right now, the answer to that is no for many, many people that we turn out year after year. So yeah. this is this is a less uh this is less about like um outcomes in the way that we talk about them in in education very often. I just want yeah. to know that you're capable of completing an application to Subway, <laughs> for instance, without yeah. any errors in it when you graduate, which is a pretty simple marker. Right now, when I say the problem, the problem is Everything from the the wealth gap to the house ownership gap to um, the employment gap, the income gap, income in inequality, and all that is rooted in um, the inability for people to qualify for jobs, to qualify yeah. for positions. So that to yeah. me is the problem. Right? Yeah, I buy that, and we have a similar background. I'm, you know, basically the, the the son of a mechanic from Long Island, so I have kind of a blue collar working background myself. Um, so, but your your what you just said re resonates me with me in two ways. One, let's set aside. I mean, let, let's let's talk about what Tiffany had to do, why she gets invoked in a book about Success Academy, a, a charter school uh, that's worth that's worth square or, or completing that circle. Um, but in terms of, <clears throat> excuse me, your frame, uh, are you prepared to, to do something um, <clears throat> that prepares you to take your place in the economic mainstream? Where I would push back slightly on that is Tiffany since we keep talking about her, well, she was born at that point. <clears throat> um, the reason her, her story resonates with me is because of that. In other words, and forgive me if I've made this point already, this was a kid and, you know, a single kid of, of, of color, single mom, or si single mom, uh, a kid of color in the South Bronx. She was profoundly invested. Um, she demonstrated her profound investment in the, in, in the American mainstream. You know, I, I, never, I don't know that this conversation happened, but you could see through her her actions that she um, you know, was probably told every day of her life, 
you know, the teacher says it, you do it, and that settles it. In other words, you know, she was she she demonstrated through her every action uh, that she viewed her education as essential. She viewed her good good behavior, good citizenship, as it were, as a non negotiable, and 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 acted that way. Um, in other words, she was buying what we were selling as mm-hmm, as educators. Mm-hmm. You know, as in, as she, she she there was not a, a moment of questioning of the value of the institution of 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 public education. So then that puts it on us. Did we um, validate that that uh, that decision, or did we um, take advantage of it? And in, <clears throat> in the story I tell about the special ed supervisor telling me what's you know she's not your problem, that suggests to me um, that we were taking advantage of her dutiful, compliant nature. We were using it as 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 an excuse to say, oh, she's fine. Don't worry about her. She's got what she needs. Mm-hmm. Um, so that 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 strikes me as a fundamentally um, as a bit of a of a bait and switch on our mm-hmm. part. We have no right to say that to somebody who is counting on us um, mm-hmm. to, to further her interest in that economic mainstream. You know what I find surprising <clears throat> about your book? Um, one of the things that I find really surprising is that uh, you get to a point, I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, where you say that culture is basically the thing. Like culture, school you know, yeah, school, school culture. culture. Yeah, school culture is is culture is a created word is the thing, and basically, school culture is based upon peer effects, um, sure. in some ways, largely, um, largely, not exclusively, but largely. Yeah. So, what's surprising for me is somebody who cares so much about uh, pedagogical interventions, right? So, we're having conversations about whether or not teachers are prepared to teach reading. Whether or not, um, whether or not we're doing math the right way, we had a big blow up about whether we should have common standards across states and across schools so that we can judge people fairly or whatnot. All of these, all of these uh, school reform um, items, menu items, um, often are just like in the realm of pedagogical intervention, right? Yeah. And then we have, and we have another one, another argument within education that's all about sociological interventions right like like integration and just making sure we mix the kids up and get them you know seated next to each other if i were on the other side of this i would like your book better than if i'm a a reformer yeah i've heard you say before that you're like equal you (laughs) you said to yourself at some point great i've written a book that everybody's gonna hate (laughs) um but if i was on the anti-reform side i would like it better i i actually would think it validates more of what what people have been trying to say I think there's some evidence for that, and I, and I wouldn't dispute that. <clears throat> I mean, it's interesting because I think my reform credentials are in pretty good order, um, but I'm probably, if I'm candid, more critical of, of the ed reform movement than just about anybody who is still mm-hmm. within it. <clears throat> um, you know, the, the anti-reform folks are not wrong in their analysis of ed reform. They're wrong in what to do about that. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. you, you can look and say, okay, and I've said this plenty, uh, reform has damaged the way we teach reading. Uh, mm-hmm. Reform has narrowed curriculum to just reading and math and nothing else. Reform, ha- reform has done all of these, you know, this, this parade of horribles, and therefore let's stop doing it. Well, no, I was, I was up to you, with you, up to the therefore let's stop doing it, mm-hmm. because you know, having it, it would be dishonest having spent so many years in a low performing public school, in a low performing district to say, oh no, this is the thing we're gonna do and we're just gonna get this right. Well, the sun is gonna go out before we mm-hmm. get that right. It's not, mm-hmm. it's not make writable in a sense. Mm-hmm. Um, so so it, it, this to me, I don't see a contradiction here between applauding the reform impulse because we're good people, right? We're we're Americans. We care about our 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 children, all of our children. Mm-hmm. That, that 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 creates a moral imperative to do right by them, and not to say, you know, fix this broken thing, or if we, you know, or 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 to be naive about our ability to fix this broken thing. Um, I mean, you know, the, to to bring it back to the book, the 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 kind of the conflict in the book is like, look, if you are affluent if you have means this is kind of not a problem for you you have the ability to 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 get your kid um a good education either um because of some of those socioeconomic factors um that the anti-reform to point out 
uh, by your ability to move to a different neighborhood, by your ability to pay private school tuition. If you are Tiffany, if you are a mm -hmm. low income kid of color who has all of that, you know, the, the, those things, um, parental engagement, um, motivation, et cetera, well, then what's our answer for you? Be patient. We're working on it. Well, that's not mm -hmm. acceptable. Mm -hmm. It's never been acceptable. Um, so you say you agree with a lot of what they have to say. It's just that when they get to the um, prescription for the problem is where it falls apart for you. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, I mean, still, they're, they're, I'm still not getting it, Robert. I'm still not getting this one part. Let me tell you the part that I'm still not getting, right? Like, yeah, I'm not getting it. You're not getting Well, I'm not getting like the okay. thing because like, and I'm trying to get this piece of it um, because I, I seriously disagree even with the analysis of the problem that the, the anti-reformers have and the traditionalists, the people who are nostalgic about what education is and was and supposed to be, yeah. who are so foggy within their bureaucratic um, belief that they think any intervention is against them, right? Well, so, so, me, so me, you know, I have a problem with the, with them. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't want to. <clears throat> excuse me, I'm losing my voice here. I don't want to um, pretend that I'm, you know, completely down with the anti-reform view of this. I mean, mm -hmm. I think it is terribly self-satisfied and nuance averse. I'm merely suggesting. <laughs> I um, <love> that. <laughs> yeah, I love I'm that. merely suggesting that that we in the reform movement are a little bit um, drunk on our own righteousness. Um, yeah, and and uh, that's not helpful either. I hate when you make that point. I agree with you partially, and then the other thing that the thing that uh, sticks out for me about that though is that the what we call the reform movement is too big a container yeah. um, to make broad mm -hmm. statements mm -hmm. about because there I'll are people that. There are people in the reform movement, a wing of the reform movement, which I think you're very much a part of, which is the like like let's just take the reading conversation as as a uh, as a place to start, right? It's empirically true that some things are going wrong with the instruction of reading, right? I think that's right. Yeah. So that's a reform argument. Uh, that that's a reform battle right now. And people have opinions all over the place, but there's just science around that, right? Sure. Um, and you could be a flat earther, or you could be somebody who just says, well, there's science around this. This isn't really a, an argument. I like those discussions mm -hmm. better because they are about um, pedagogical and what we can do in the way that we give instruction, in the way that we assess, in the way that we... These are safer to me debates to have yeah. than like whether or not integration is the thing that will make everything work. I, I, right? I'm, I'm smirking a little bit here, Chris, because, um, you know, uh, back in the day, I suppose there's no reason not to be candid about this. You and I were not always, you know, simpatico. <laughs> that's, that's an understatement. <laughs> yeah, and I, was, and I was the guy who was like, Chris, you really need to focus on what kids are learning. And like, I was, I was trying to get you interested in, in issues of pedagogy and and curriculum. So I'm going to like, you know, pat myself on the back and and, and it, you know, at least pretend that I had some influence there in, in getting you to focus on that stuff. Um, so, but anyway, I, I don't want to well, I will say this. I always thought that that was important. I think the place where you and I now are even landing in different spots was I assumed then, like I was one of the people long ago who bought into the 90, 90, 90 schools thing. And I'm still someone who buys into the um, the Karen Chenoweth school of thought, which is it can be done and it's being done better. My assumption back then, which you've disputed in your book now, my assumption back then was something pedagogically was being done differently in the charter schools. Yeah, like they, yeah. they were doing something that was like, so, so maybe I didn't name it exactly that back then. And maybe I didn't have the language for it, but I assumed that in the charter schools, something different with the teachers and the instruction was going on to make magic happen. And even yeah, like yeah. getting to the end of your book, I mean, I think what I would take from your book is that's the actually probably not necessarily true. The most oh, definitely not true. Yeah, like the, the biggest, and this is where I think the anti-reform people really have like a, you put some wind in their sails is basically show me who the parents are when they show up with the kids to the school and I'll tell you how your school's going to be, like how it's going to perform. Now, see, okay, I, I guess this is, I'm, I'm going to quote myself here. I've become fond of saying that every <laughs> conversation in education very quickly gets to the point where you say, well, it's complicated or it's not worth having. And we are now at the point where we have to say, well, it's complicated. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I mean, and now we've thrown so many things on the table. I'm not sure which which thread to pull on here. Um, 
I mean, to me, that one of the, the 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 big failures of the education reform movement historically has been its indifference to to what happens in the classroom. You know, I mean, fifteen or twenty years ago, the the the, the superstars of our world were economists, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, Who would kind mm-hmm. of you know treat the classroom as a black box and pretend that all you need to know is what comes out of it. But that assumes that everything that goes into it is the same. And now we're just measuring who does it, you know, really well and who does it poorly. Mm-hmm. And I've always thought, well, that's, that's bizarre. I mean, where'd you get that idea? Um, so, um, and I've, I've nattered on about this, you know, I'm bored myself now for years on this. Um, but, but unless you have a good, to your point, you know, pedagogical curriculum model, it's just very different. So it's this, the, the assumption that um, you know, you know, call a school a charter, put charter on the door, and 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 it's going to tell you something about what happens inside, hmm. um, is just not so. Um, especially, uh, you know, w- when the vast majority of teachers who come to us come from the same you know models of of you know uh, ed schools and whatnot, and 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 so so this is another failure of the you know what we are calling the anti reform movement. Um, is you know they, they are probably no less um, uh, incurious about pedagogy and, and curriculum. That in other words, it, for those of us in the reform movement who are assuming, well, you know, um, what you need to do is free uh, schools and teachers from bureaucracy, and good things will happen. That's a nuance of worst, uncomplicated way of viewing this. In the same way of uh, an anti-reform person saying, "Well, look, it's just a question of resources and parenting," and you know, both of those mindsets are are, are indifferent. Uh, I would argue to what's happening inside the classroom. So, or people who say just say trust teachers, trust teachers and send more money. Just send um, more money and trust teachers. Yeah. Um, uh, that, that's not acceptable. So here's something, a quote. Okay. The moment a parent in a district with struggling schools is motivated to enter a charter school lottery, she is distinguishing herself from her neighbor who bundles her child off to the neighborhood school, unaware or incurious about the uh, about what else might be available. The simple act of volition at least suggests a nominally engaged family, dissatisfied or curious enough to at least explore other options. So tell me you know, why that's wrong. Yeah. um, Because I know you disagree with that statement. So tell me what I got wrong. Well, so this is what I, I, first of all, I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a hasty generalization. So I would want to know, do yeah, we have I do that do, for a living interest, right? No, That's- you don't. No, you don't. You're very, and this is what I want to say about your book too, because actually just like you, you stick on culture so much as somebody who's really fond of words. I just want to say that like, regardless of what you said in this book, the writing is just so clear and concise and great that like, it'll keep you reading whether you agree or not. So, um, and, and that's like, like, that's a, a personal obsession with mine. Like if you're going to write, write well. <laughs> like if you're going to write a book, you know, write a book that I, I want to read. G- George Will is like my favorite. He's like the, the guy. And I'll disagree with so much that he will write, but I just don't care because there's there's just such good writing there. So, um, so, the, so, so the point, I don't think your book is full, filled with hasty generalization, generalizations. I think this is one, though, where I would be asking at least, very least, do we have like Peter Bergman or somebody from Columba, Columbia that has um, research on the different types of parents? Like, well, uh, do we know for sure that the parent who just by the act of enrolling or trying to enroll in a charter school is uh, is somehow higher up on a scale of something? I don't know what to even to call it. Um, I, 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 I will I will accept your characterization of it as a hasty generalization, but let me kind of you know throw this back at you. Are, are you suggesting, and I think this is another critique I would make of the ed reform movement, um, are you suggesting that parental engagement has nothing to do with student outcomes? Um, I think again, I think that's like that that's a, an extreme. Like that yeah. there's I'm somewhere more in the middle. I think that's an extreme, like like, um, yeah, no, I'm not suggesting that parental involvement has, I, I am suggesting this. Um, when you look at the s- successful people who have come out of poverty, um, they have mm-hmm. many different stories, right? And they have many different yeah. backgrounds and they have many different family situations and, and whatever. And but what's the way to know, bet? Oh, what's, what's that? What's the way to bet? In other words, if, wouldn't you, don't you think it's a safe wager? Not exclusively. I'm taking yeah. your point with yeah. with out of a brush. But but in the aggregate, don't you think that 
uh, and let me invoke, you know, my, my friend Ian Rowe here. Don't you think mm -hmm. that the, 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 the kid who comes from a stable home uh, with, a, with a strong upbringing, parental engagement, a strong sense of right or wrong, et cetera, don't you think that kid is more likely to, to be upwardly mobile than, than the kid who just... I would say, I'd say it's, you know, yes. I would say just shortly, I'd say yes. I think like you like nuances. So here's here's where I think it would get complicated is like, did you see that New York Times story a while back where they had a graph that would show you um, black folks who start out in the wealthier families, the rate at which they drop out of wealth and drop into the lower rungs of society. And it was a model that showed you, it was a moving model, right? It would show you in real time, like them dropping out or whatnot. Um, I think that went a long way to say, like, you could be born with all, born into all of the advantage, advantages in world in the world, yeah. and it's still going to matter where you get your services, what systems you're in, what yeah. the systems are like, how they've been designed. Um, but but let's say you and I perfectly agree on the parents, on the kids that come from very involved parents. Yeah. Um, so let's just say, okay, they exist and take them out of the debate. Okay, oh, now let's. Who are we taking out of the debate? The kids with the engaged parents. The the ones who ca the ones who we feel like are coming with the advantages, like the advantage of of, of parents. About those kids, do you want to take them off the? I have nothing else to talk about them. No, well, no, no, no. I don't mean like take them out of the debate as if they don't matter. I mean like let's just say we've satisfied our need to to solve for them, so we've gotten them we set up. It. And now, no, no, we haven't. This is totally like an uh, uh, a hypothetical, right? Like, okay, let's say we addressed, we did everything we're supposed to do to address their needs. And then now we're still left with this other group of people. I think what the public education stalwarts would say is reform was always about those other kids. Like that's all chartering and everything is. It's always been about the Tiffany's of the world. And that's the only way you guys have ever had any success. Now we're the ones who have to deal with everybody else. Like we're the ones who have to solve for the kids that you guys in reform never wanted to educate, right? This, is, this gets um, back to, I guess, one of the theses in the book, which is the heart. Um, and I'm going to invoke my, it's complicated. That there is, okay, let me back up here because I do think at some point now or later, Addressed the kind of again nuance averse way that those of us in the reform movement come to communities of color, um, and here we, we are we are just we are, we are no less nuance averse than than some who we are ideologically opposed to. So mm -hmm, we can talk mm -hmm. about. Um, but I like the idea, and I'm with you. If this is where you're going, I think well, there's a range here. Um, you know, it's funny uh, about Success Academy. We haven't even talked about them, which is fine. I mean, but let's let's talk about the, the the Ed Reform Movement. Is it true that the Ed Reform Movement is all about you know functional families and kids? I don't think it is. But let's let, let's let's play with your idea. Mm -hmm, let's just mm -hmm, do it. Mm -hmm, in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what is the harm the, 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 to, to society in accepting that proposition? So saying, okay, high performing charter schools. Uh, you're you're going to be all about the Tiffany's. You're going to help them um, not, not just be part of the economic mainstream, but to 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 reach their 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 their, their true potential in American life. Go mm -hmm. do that. Great. Mm -hmm. um, well, then that says to um, the anti-reform people in the schools for, or people who work in the schools, like where I used to teach, uh, you now have a very different job. Your job really is um, to get kids in the game, to engage the disengaged. Um, to be something that may be a little bit closer to social work than education. Mm -hmm. Well, what's wrong with that? That actually mm -hmm. might be productive. Um, I mean, I reject it as, a, as, as like a good thing. I reject it because number one, I think it's always going to matter. This is where I like stick with Karen Chenoweth in this. Whoever shows up in your classroom, I think it's going to matter who's teaching, how they were prepare, prepared, what they're teaching, what their coaching has been, what type of supports they have, what curriculum are they using, how long have they taken to put together the frame of how they teach for the kids that they have in their classroom who come from any background. And I think for the longest time, reform was really focused on the kids who were the furthest behind. How do we get them closer to what middle class people are doing in terms of performance? And they, the the argument against them was, no, you guys aren't really um, helping out 
the poorest of the poor kids. We are. The school districts are. You're just cherry picking. And that does get us to like the Success Academy um, um, discussion, because I think what they found in your book was what they had been waiting for, which is basically the smoking gun that Success Academy's success is not about what they do in classrooms. It's about how yeah. they select their parents. And I I think that's a nuance of verse reading. Um, and look, candidly, um, I know that there is some concern with the Success Academy uh, that that was the takeaway. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, mm -hmm. you're, 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 we're cherry picking parents. Well, that's, I, I don't think I could have been any more clear about this. Um, on the one hand, I think we have an obligation to, to candor and to, to, to honesty to say, look, um, this is not the, the, the dead reform homily about, oh, we can do this with a child, because you can't, because you don't. Um, that is not to say that there's not a significant value add component. And again, I could, have been, could not have been clear about this in the book. Success Academy, um, and we don't have to bore people with the mechanics of this, but just suffice it to say that you know the book at some length ex explores how they do appeal to um, uh, the most motivated parents and how they have uh, processes in place that make it is very difficult for for less than engaged and, and families with significant bandwidth to make it through their enrollment process. Just take that as a given. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but I mean, I also say quite clearly in multiple times. Look, they, they outscore the gifted and talented programs in New York City who literally handpick their kids. Um, if this district, which is overwhelmingly low income, black and brown, if this if this CMO, Success Academy, were a standalone school district, it would be the highest performing school district in New York State. And not mm -hmm. by a lot, by a lot. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. obviously there, there's a, a tremendous value add there. But what does that what does that tell you? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we are not sufficiently differentiating between the family. We, we are we are doing exactly what you critique, Chris, saying, oh, mm -hmm. we are these communities as monoliths. We are not differentiating. Um, you know, it's it's interesting to me the 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 you know, I, I have a good enough sense of of when I'm gonna write something that's gonna get me in trouble and and land <laughs> you know <laughs> my first rodeo. Um, the, the thing that I labored long and hard with in this book and, and wanted to take out, you know, not because I don't admire this man's work, I do, but just because he's a lightning rod. There's a quote from Charles Murray at the end of the book, which to me- Oh my like, God, I'm glad you're raising that because I yeah. underlined that quote. Yeah, it's, um, it's a funny quote in the woo! entire book and nobody said boo about it. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and I put it in there because I don't like stealing somebody else's ideas and nobody said it better. And I'm going to paraphrase it from memory. He said, look, the job is, and this kind of puts a bow in this whole conversation. The quote was something to the effect of, it is not the job of, of the government or public policy uh, to, to determine the worthy. It is the job of public policy to allow the worthy to, or to identify the worthy. It's the job of public policy to allow the worthy to identify themselves. Yeah. Um, and this I think is, I said this exactly I it. on um, 322, page 322. Government cannot identify the worthy, but it can protect a society in which the worthy can identify themselves. And right. that was from his yeah, book, I, 1984 I, book, Losing Ground. I don't care for the, 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 the idea of worthiness as a, as a frame there. Um, but when I read that quote, I think of, of the kids like Tiffany who are self-identifying and we are doing nothing for them. So what's the upshot of this when I went to Success Academy? What do I see there? Tiffany in every mm -hmm. scene is mm -hmm. that kid. Now, does that mean then this is where it gets complicated again? Are they just recruiting the Tiffany's or are they creating them? I think it's both. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm not a social scientist. I'm basically a journalist. So I can't say, well, it's 30% of one, 70% of the other. But this gets that school culture piece. In my old school, Tiffany was an outlier. At a mm. success academy, she's, she, would be a, a, she would dominate the culture or that type of kid is the culture keeper. And, and you normalize achievement. You normalize ambition. You normalize this, this thing that she seemed to have been born with, which is there's this thing called a school and this is the thing that I need to get me where I want to go. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the thing that, that um, we, we kind of suck dry mm -hmm. in, in, you know, 
You're breaking up just a little bit there. You're breaking up. Sorry. Um, for our viewers, um, um, please keep viewing. We're having a little yeah. little technical difficulty there. Okay. Are you back there? Okay. Um, this is not a uh, this is not a a uh, a conflict for affluent Americans. Mm -hmm. If you are a parent of Tiffany, uh, there is nothing standing in your way of your education leading you to where we all want our education to lead. Uh, we are not putting um, functional hurdles in front of that kid. Um, if you are low income, black or brown, then it's at the pleasure, so to speak, of of, of the institution, your teachers, and that is that is just fundamentally unjust. So I want to read a paragraph that I think is, um, well, let me just read it first. The explicit end of much current education policy is raising academic achievement measured principally through test scores. But if this end is dispro disproportionately influenced by whom children go to school with and their parents' attitudes, beliefs, commitment to education, it is a thorny issue for education policymakers to solve for. Even to suggest that school culture matters is significant or determinative. In this context, meaning parental engagement, student motivation, and a focused and intentional effort to direct it by educators violates the egalitarian impulses that undergird, undergird the education reform movement's lofty ideals and much uh, current policy and practice. We may need to rethink nearly all of it. I can't think of a more devastating paragraph for education reform in a book um, that I've read within the last five years. And, and, and that includes Diane Ravitch's, you know, like her, her, her ode to the, uh, her ode to unionism. Um, yeah, we can talk about that too. I reviewed that book for commentary. It's a very good uh, review I saw that you had of it. But th that's a, Robert, that's a devastating paragraph. It needn't be. Um, because again, I mean, maybe we're talking past each other here, Chris. Mm -hmm. But how can you say, okay, now I'm going to interview you. Yeah. <laughs> how can you say on the one hand that we are guilty of viewing communities, uh, low-income communities of color as a monolith, but then take issue with that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I guess, you know, the main point of reform is starts with the belief that all the kids that we have in the system right now can be doing better than they could. Well, let, let's just take a few things on. First of all, the achievement gap basically is, is structured around achievement tests, right? Correct. It, it's a term of art. So it's like when people get into the opportunity gap and they start naming other gaps, like, you know, the birth weight gap and these other gaps, it's not the term of art. The term of art is these are achievement tests that we've had forever. They measure yeah. they measure something and they have forever. And the there's, there's a test score gap. Period. It's a test score gap. Yeah. Like, and it has been since the seventies with Jenks and others. So yeah. it's, it, it's basically a test score gap. Test scores do tell us something and the yeah. build and the failure on those tests does tell us something. Like if my kids come home and all of a sudden one year that they, they had dropped through the floor on those, I would be alarmed as a middle-class parent. <laughs> I, I would think they tell us something. Um, but this point about what, why those test scores, there is a gap. There's an argument about whether or not is it the material? Are the kids not mastering because they're not being taught well? There's a there's a range of pedagogical reasoning for why people believe that that gap exists. And then there's a school of thought of I've heard teachers say things like, basically, show me who the parents are and I'll tell you how how well their kids are going. And that feels very determinative and like educational essentialism which is yeah. basically kind of like educational essentialism is what I think actually ruins the anti-reform movement is basically they yeah. start with show me who your parents are and I'll tell you how well a school can do. Yeah. And I don't believe then, that. Then we're, not, then we're not that far apart because what I'm saying is if the, 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 there, are, there are twin sins here uh, and they are equally nuance diverse. The Reform movement educational essential is indeed guilty, I think, more often than not, of a kind of educational essential. says this in her book, that, 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 that mm -hmm. uh, uh, our, our tech of socioeconomic status. Well, that's clearly an overly broad statement. But we make overly mm -hmm. broad statements, too. Um, now, maybe, you know, 
uh, people who I respect tend not to make these statements, but you've heard this a lot, right? The only difference is the door the kids go goes goes in in the morning. The kid goes in this door, they get a good outcome. They go in that door, it gets a bad outcome. Well, that's not true either, right? So, so it just my I guess my plea here is is let's see the thing for for what it actually is. You know, there's a lot of moving parts. Teacher quality matters, pedagogy, curriculum, all the things we discussed. Well, parents matter too. You know, so why why would we build a, an ed reform movement on a foundation that the only thing that's worth discussing is what happens in a school all day? I mean, you know, I, and here I think I don't need to apologize for my own views on this. I mean, I've been the guy in the reform movement for the past decade or so who when everybody's talking about, you know, teacher quality, data, testing, funding, I'm like, um, can we talk about what the kids do all day? That's mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you know, I'm 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 long on the record talking about, mm -hmm. you know, let's get inside of that black box. But that's not the same thing as that's the only thing that matters. You know, you know, forgive my French, but shit's complicated, Chris. You know, it's gotta, complicated. But there's oh. there's like one thing in life that makes life a lot easier is working on the things that you control, right? Like this is just yeah. it, in, in, in parenting, in parenting, and family relationships, and in marriages, right? Like only okay. dealing with the things you can control in a marriage. Surely, um, there's a difference no. between I'm going to focus on what I, what I can control and saying the stuff that I can control doesn't matter. That those are two different things, right? Okay, so so how would it? How would you act on? I think those other things matter. Because like, it's what, like here's what so. Because if we say it doesn't matter, then we're then we're then we are we're stacking the deck. And this is where I will be frankly sympathetic mm -hmm. with the anti-reform people. It just doesn't make sense to say, uh, and and you know, I, I, you've heard me say this, and you've you've teased me about this. That every time I do an interview about this book, I say, look, I'm not even Moskowitz's cheerleader. I'm not her. her <laughs> you know? And I'm not. But yeah. it doesn't make sense to. Uh, and I know. Look, I'm 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 very not just respectful, but I'm warmly disposed towards what she's created. I think it's a great good thing. Uh, for the families that it serves, it serves very well. But that's not the same thing as every school must be a success academy. And that's not the same thing as looking at my old school and saying, hey, how come you can't deliver the results that she delivers? Because mm -hmm. we're not in the same game. I and feel that's like okay. It, I feel it lets a lot of schools off the hook. When you, you know, and I've visited a lot of schools. I've, I've visited, you know, in the last decade, you know, I've visited a lot of schools in the last decade. And what I've noticed is just a wide variance in terms of what people do, what the leadership Absolutely. looks like, what the teachers look like, how much they share an agenda or not. Like some schools you go in and the teachers are all in the same wavelength oh, and mean, you can see it school, and some aren't. School. Yeah. School well, culture. I mean, yeah. you know, and, and that's something that's something whether your parents are good, bad, ugly, employed, unemployed or whatnot that is something that is deeply within your control, right? So I feel I, I feel a little bit like until you have really gotten your own house in order, it's hard to start blaming things outside of your house when you have a messy house, right? Like, like you know, Karen will tell you that she, she can show you schools that are doing well with kids and they're not selecting for the parents. They don't have, like you have traditional public schools in traditional public school districts that are outperforming all of the other schools around them without any type of selecting, like without any type of, but pedagogically, they're just stronger than the other sure. schools around them. You know, they're just doing a better job. I think reform would want to see more of yes. those type of schools, like more of those schools. But you know what I want to see more of? I want to see more of those schools sustaining that effort. And I, I don't mean to pick on Karen, who I like and mm -hmm. respect, and, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I'm a, a, a fan of her work, um, but I will lay you significant odds that if you go and look at any it's being done school from 10 years ago, is it still being done 10 years from hence? Usually not. Because mm -hmm. in other words, it tends to be, and I'm I, here I am painting with a broad brush again, there's a moment in time where, where you have a charismatic dynamic leader, you've got staff buy-in, etc. It's really hard to sustain those things over time. It's a lot easier, not easy, easier uh, in a charter school. Um, this is where we don't hold ourselves accountable enough, uh, where you have the power of, of pedagogy, curriculum, hiring and firing, where you can kind of you know, impose that culture that is just really, really hard to do in a, in a, in a more traditional setting. 
Um, so on the one hand, yes, I do agree with you and with Karen that it can be done outside of the charter world. It's just damn harder, and it's and it's especially hard to sustain it. So I am sympathetic. Like Ian Rowe and I have talked about this a lot. Like you know, we talk about this this because um, I, I guess we're all going to land in a place where it, it matters what happens in a school. It matters what happens at home. It matters yeah, what happens in a family. It matters what happens in teaching. Like none of these things are going to stop mattering. Um, it matters whether or not you have two parents or not, um, um, these type of discussions. I think we get led away from what we can actually do to improve schools the more we start talking about things that we have no control over. And whether or not somebody got married, for instance, or didn't, is something yeah. like I can say, Ian and I sh can share an idea that it matters. I don't think we can do anything next Monday to make sure that a teacher is better at teaching math by caring about, by talking endlessly about the fact that the kid has, has no father, right? I'm never going to say that fathers don't matter. I think fathers matter a lot. And yeah. I want to talk to all men listening to this and say, do your damn job, right? Yeah. Like you, you are a father. There is something that comes along with that. Yeah. However, um, I don't want teaching to be dependent on us fixing that debate or winning that debate, because actually to tell you the truth, men have been louts for all of history, <laughs> yeah. right? Like men have fallen down on their job for all of history. Um, and, you know, I mean, just not pick on, on men because there's, you know, mothers matter too, you know? Um, are, are you not, do you, do you not think that there is even just a scintilla of, of artifice? Uh, I wanted to come up with the right word there among those of us who call ourselves reformers in suggesting to, to um, traditional public schools, regardless of the circumstance, we expect these, the, 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 these, these good outcomes from you. Don't you think that we're kind of a little bit unfair by, by, take, by, 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 by suggesting? Or well, let me start this. Um, so I, I bristle at like reform period. Cause like, I'm not, I don't consider myself an education reformer. Right. So I, I bristle at that just a little bit in general because. Yeah, a complicated relationship with it. Well, I don't think that the system can be reformed. Like, I don't think reform is the right word. I don't think, I think it's way too gentle and polite for what needs to happen to improve public education. Okay. Right. So this is where you and I depart. Like you are really against the unschooling stuff and whatnot. And it, we, you know, we've had some fun back and forth about that. Like, I actually think the system is so, so, so troubled in so many ways that have co compounded over time. J just to give like a, a non-fitting example that might, un you know, give credit to what I'm saying right now. If you just look at how pensions are done with teachers in, in, um, in schools and in public education, you come to a point where you say, that's never going to be solvable. That's never, we're never going to solve that. Now think about if you think that same way about pedagogy within public schools, yeah. right? Like the pension problem is the same, same for that. So I don't really think, uh, I think reform is a losing battle. Well, I think it's and, lost. I mean, let, let's, let's I, th I do think it's lost. Yeah. This, yeah. This is, this is where I'm going to, you know, uh, defend Diane Ravitch's brief, although it's not really, the, it's the argument oh, she God. should do. Don't do it. Yeah. If you go back to the history of reform, you know, circa 1983 and the nation at risk, if, if the, the impetus was we, we need to create that rising tide that lifts all boats, well, we failed and, and we're not going to succeed because we've had 40 years. Yeah. Um, if, 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 the, if the standard reform playbook of standards, accountability, testing, et cetera, was going to create that kind of rising effect, we would have seen it long ago. Now, we're the anti -reform That's not true, Robert, though. That's just actually statistically not true. If you look at the trend line of from 70, let's, let's pick a year, 71, 72, 73, um, and today. And if you look at just black kids, take everybody out of the equation. Because I think what one of the problems is... Sorry, yeah. you're, you're not contradicting my point. You were you're, you're anticipating the point it was about to make. Which is, it's gotten is better. Rather, like we've done better. You would rather yeah. be, in other words, to say that it's as as Diane Ravitch says in a most recent book that it's all failed is yeah. simply incorrect. No, that's right. Um, you would that's much right. rather be, and you are far better off being a low income kid of color in a in a large city in a high performing charter school than you would have been in that same uh, city forty years ago. That strikes me as being indisputable. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. the, the idea that you wouldn't rather be 
you know, in New York and KIPP and Uncommon and Democracy Prep, where I teach occasionally uh, at Success Academy, that, that there's no difference whatsoever is, is, is simply a lie. It's just mm-hmm. not true. But right. that's not the same thing as a movement that creates a rising tide that, that lifts achievement broadly. And in that regard, Ed Reform has failed. Hmm. That, that becomes kind of a little bit like um, where you set your goals. Like, like this is what, something I think Ravitch does. Ravitch, Ravitch says that reform failed because it didn't do things that it never said it was going to do, right? <laughs> reform never said, never, never said, for instance, like, like charter schools. Let's just, uh, I've done a lot of talking to people who were in the charter school origins at the beginning of it. And it was really about giving parents an alternative and a choice because parents were going to start getting those anyways through things like open enrollment and vouchers and whatever. And it was kind of like a firewall to to parents choosing something outside of the schools. Whether or not it was really essentially going to be 10 times better or not better, the early charter schools were really kind of crunchy. They were like, they weren't all like, you know, about student achievement and test scores. As a matter of fact, a lot of them were about like, you know, environmental, you know, um, um, science yeah, yeah. and, a lot, you know, hippie stuff, so, you know, whatever. I'm, I'm just trying to be precise here, Chris, which is in 1983, a nation at risk, there were no such thing as charter schools. There was no such That's thing right. as a value. There was no such thing as school choice. I don't even think it existed in Milton Friedman's head at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, but so, so, but the, the clarion call that went out that started the reform movement was this language in a nation at risk about if an unfriendly foreign power had imposed these conditions, we'd have viewed it as an act of war. Mm-hmm. Everything else was a response to that. Mm-hmm. Um, one assumes that the response was, look, we have, we, we it, it didn't, I make a joke about this. It, it, it wasn't called New Orleans at risk. It wasn't called Newark <laughs> at risk. It was called the nation at risk. Right, right. So, so the idea that 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 we have that the reform movement has benefited the nation at large is demonstrably false. That's not right. necessarily a criticism. It was too yeah. big of a job. This is where um so and I and we're gonna wrap soon and I want to ask you a question about like you know just a a question that puts a bow on this for you. But before we do, I'll just say this because you you invoke Diane Ravitch and anyone who has read read all of her work over time. Um, she, she is the one who led me to make a joke about the fact, uh, um, what was a joke. I, I made the joke once that, um, that God made the public school and on the next day people said about trying to reform it. And it's been that way ever <laughs> since. Right. Right. And, and, um, in her, in her scholarship, she will tell you that reform has always existed. So it didn't it, it didn't start with nation at risk. Her her documentation of reform goes back to the very early days, and you know, like she she category or she chronicles all the reform battles that education has had from day one. Most of them were administrative or pedagogical in the earlier days, right? And then we had the Russian scare, you know, in in the sixties and seventies and eighties, and integration and all these other things, but. She's talking about, I guess what she's talking about is, is modern conservative education reform is po- probably what she's talking about. Not just yeah, I mean, reform I mean, in general. That she's forgotten that anything happened before then. I mean, from her most recent book, it leaves the impression that everything was fine until, you know, billionaires right. came along and broke it all. Yeah. And it's such a cartoon. The billionaires, Bill Gates, the billionaires, boys and girls club. They yeah, just yeah, ruined, yeah. they ruined it. Such a perfect system. So in wrapping, you know, I would ask you. Um, cause first of all, let me just say for people watching, you should get the book. It's, um, how the other half learns by Robert Pondicio. You should read it and we should argue about it. I have lots of stuff in here, um, underlined and we're going to keep talking Robert. So just, just so you know about this book, I think it was an exceptionally well written book. Um, so whether I agree with it or not, actually it made it easy to get through because it's, it's just, the writing is just spectacular. But if you, with all that you've learned and all that you've seen, you've, you've taught in in classrooms, you've, um, talked to a lot of families and educators and you've written a book and you've actually been embedded in a school that's considered to be a successful school. If now you had to start the Robert Pondicio Academy of all that I've learned, like what school, what would you, where would you put your focus if you had to start up an urban school today? Yeah, that's a really good question. And we, we made it a whole other hour because, <laughs> because football, um, you know, I mean, there's, it's, it's, it's interesting because I've, I've evolved in my own thinking over the years. I guess maybe haven't, my, my thoughts haven't changed. I've just kind of added on to them. And I've also 
uh, become, you know, much more choice oriented than I was, uh, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, look, I mean, you know, I, I say this all the time. I'm, I'm an unrepentant um, advocate of E.D. Hirsch Jr.'s view mm -hmm. of, of knowledge. Um, because of all that I know and all that I've learned by accident about literacy and background knowledge, I mean, this is this is what it takes. Uh, if you are concerned, as, as I am, as, as I'm sure we both are, most particularly about um, uh, low-income kids of color in, in America, you know, because they're the ones who are, you know, um, of, of the, have the greatest needs educationally. Every kid I've ever taught has been a low-income kid of color, et cetera. That's kind of my orientation in this work. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, the, that's the, the, the short answer to what would I do. That's no different than what you asked me 20 years ago. You know, do what Hirsch says. This mm -hmm. is the guy who cracked the code. He's figured it out. And it's been good to see, you know, some, some, uh, some acknowledgement of that more, more recently. You were invoking, you know, the reading wars. You know, that, that, that's become a thing now. Mm -hmm. God bless mm -hmm. Um, that's not the same thing as wanting to impose that, however, on on every uh, every American child, um, because you know th this is this is where I you know uh, get in trouble with the Karen Chenowitz of the world and others you know who I consider allies in in the curriculum wars. Um, I've said this, and people think I'm I'm kidding. I'm not. I would rather my child uh, be in a classroom with a teacher who is completely devoted and dedicated to, to a pedagogy or curriculum that I can't stand, then be forced to do what I want her to do, you know, through a forced march. Because I've been in schools um, where I see teachers doing what I think is best in class curriculum, and it's horrible um, because mm -hmm. they're not engaged, because they're not enthusiastic, because they don't themselves have the background or background knowledge to deliver effective instruction. So you got to be careful what you wish for. This is a long, yet another long, windy answer to your fairly simple questions. Um, you know, what but but you if do? you were running the school, what would you do to get well, staff, like to make sure that you didn't hire teachers that well, were going to do it exceptionally poorly? If if you want to like really start to explore a a, a um, a, an argumentative vein of war, Chris, let's start with this: charter schools should be better than they are. You know, mm -hmm. not a little better, but a lot better. Because if I were running that school that you described, well, I've got a lot of power that I would not have had if I were running my old district school, you know, in, in, in the South Bronx. I have the power of hiring and firing. I've got the power of curriculum. I've got the power of saying, no, in this school that we teach this way, I've got the power of culture saying, here's the things we believe in this school. And if you don't believe in these things and you're not willing to be an advocate for these things, well, this is not the place for you to be. Mm. Um, you know, so in other words, Charter schools have uh, a lot more control over these things, and then that's another way in which they're they're, they're different. And I want to, I would prefer that we lean into those differences. Um, so maybe I just answered your question. I mean, I, I want to do I want a knowledge rich curriculum. Um, I want a I know nobody we don't say this anymore because it's in bad odor for complicated reasons. I want a kind of a more of a no excuses in, environment mm -hmm. uh, because I think school culture matters, um, and I want to be able to say this is what we stand for, this is what we will not stand for. That's hard to do in a, in a in a more traditional setting. Um, yeah, I want those motivated parents. I want parents mm -hmm. choosing me because I'm clear about. Um, this is our curriculum, this is our pedagogy, this is our culture, and we want you to be enthusiastic about those things and choose us because of those things. Mm -hmm. um, in short, there's a lot of moving parts in a good outcome. And the more that you can be intentional and focused and overt about you know, communicating them clearly to, to, to the community, and the more you have the ability to, to, to vote with their feet and say, yes, I want these things, um, as opposed to, well, I don't really like these things, but the alternative is really horrible, so I'm just going to have to hold my nose and accept what you're, you know, what what you're you're offering. Um, you know, that that's where you start. Well, I appreciate you coming on today. Um, what I, I mean, will say, you know, we, I'm, we're going to have you coming back again because we talked a little bit about your book today, and I actually most of my questions were around the book because I've wanted to ask you some of these questions, but I do want to come back again. I, I want to keep talking first of all, and I want um, us to have this discussion as an ongoing discussion because there's some other things like this last question that I just asked you, I think is a, a rich question for discussion. I do believe deeply like our overlap, your and I overlap where we overlap greatly is I believe that there are pedagogical interventions that are not being done and aren't, aren't even people aren't curious enough about those to where okay. I, I consider everything else noise at this <clears throat> point, right? I, I really do consider the other stuff important, 
I will give you that. I believe that it matters. I can say words like it matters and all that, but it's noise to me until we win the reading wars, the math wars, the 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 the, soci uh, um, the sociology wars, the the science wars. Right? We have so much to work with, so much work to do with the core instructional work of public schooling. Period. Yeah. Um, that no, I. I that I feel like if we can like just dig in on that and let people stop getting a free pass away from that, this is where I think you and I are, are like definitely aligned with each other. Yeah. And I think I that mean, stuff matters a lot. Like it's yeah. core. Um, yeah. So thank you so much. How can people get in touch with you by the way, too? If oh, anybody I'm, watching I'm, this, you can you know, I'm, I'm not hard to find um, on social media. <laughs> I'm, 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 I have to make sure I've got the lingo, right? My DMS are open. So in other yeah. words, you can message me on Twitter at our Punditio, whether or not we are um, followers of each oh, other. I didn't know you could even do that. Look at you. Yeah. I'm fancy. It's one of the few redeeming features of Twitter. Um, yeah, my, my, my email address is rpundicio at aol.com. Uh, don't make fun of my AOL address. It's older than you. <laughs> it uh, sure is. <laughs> but, but, but before we go, Chris, I want to pay you a compliment. Um, you know, we, we kind of make jokes about this that you, you – you and I, my, and I think at one point you tried to excommunicate me from the education reform movement. I forgive you. <laughs> I kicked but, you out. <laughs> but it, it has been genuinely thrilling to me to watch your activities in this space and to see you become um, the, 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 the powerful and sure voice that you have become. Uh, you know, again, um, our backgrounds are different, but every kid I've ever taught has been a low income kid of color. Um, that's my, my interest, my, my, I think my moral, um, mm. uh, obligation in this work is to, 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 to sweat things for those kids. Uh, but you have just become a peerless advocate for, for those kids and families. And I thank you for that. I appreciate that. That is such a uh, great praise, great place to end on Robert. We're going to keep talking. And, um, and I think actually we should form a discussion group around your book. Cause there's so much rich material in here for us to argue about and talk about, um, that we should do it. Um, thanks Robert. We'll talk soon. Thanks, Chris. Be well. Thanks to all the listeners.